It's important that our country continues to rely on a very diverse supply of energy. The United States is facing a critical shift in the near future with a growing demand for energy to meet the increased demand of power plant retirements, policy and regulatory requirements that we've talked a great deal about this week. If we don't maintain that diverse uh, fuel supply, we're at a huge risk for the decades to come. Nuclear power needs to be in that mix. It needs to have a part of the mix. Because of the prevalence of nuclear power in the southern states, I'm very pleased that our next speaker is with us here to talk about the future of nuclear energy from his very learned perspective. The Honorable William C. Ostendorf began his second term as commissioner of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, and living near a nuclear plant, we never even use that term, it's always the NRC. Uh, and he began in July of 2011. His current term will expire June 30, 2016. Mr. Ostendorf has uh, led a very distinguished career. He has been an engineer, legal counsel, policy advisor, and naval officer. Before joining the NRC, he served as the director of the Committee on Science, Engineering, and Public Policy, and director of the Board on Global Science Technology at the National Academies of Science and Engineering. Mr. Ostendorf was an officer in the United States Navy from 1976 to 2002, and we thank him sincerely for that service to our country. He earned a bachelor's degree in systems engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy, law degrees from the University of Texas and Georgetown University. Will you please welcome Commissioner Ostendorf. Had total knee replacement surgery a couple months ago, and I'm trying to do this trip without a cane, so I apologize for the awkwardness of walking up here. Bill, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my wife and I, shortly after we got married, moved down to Charleston, South Carolina, where I was stationed aboard a submarine back in 1977 to 80. And so I appreciate having a South Carolina connection here with the intro. I was looking at this, I grew up in Louisiana. I've lived uh, all but 18 months of my life in one of the member states of the SSEB. Uh, spent 16 years in sea duty, most of it in Norfolk, Virginia, on submarines. And so a lot of the member state uh, connections and your uh, lo localities I'm very familiar with. As a commissioner, I have uh, visited uh, nuclear power plants in 11 of the states comprising the Southern States Energy Board. When I walked into my sit down over there this morning, I walked in and saw this news article, and I couldn't figure out if it was targeted toward just myself or others. It says, curb the appetite of federal regulators. Now, now I am a safety regulator as part of an independent regulatory commission, and I realize you've been discussing that yesterday uh, in, in your meetings. I'm just glad I, I did not see this before I had my bacon and eggs this morning. Okay, that was supposed to be a joke. All right, let's get right into it here. Ken asked me to cover these topics. Uh, I'm going to do so. These basically will not make any predictions about the future of nuclear energy, but they will give you some idea of some of the issues that the nuclear industry is wrestling with now and some of the factors and policy concerns that exist. Right now, as I speak today, we have 100 nuclear power plants operating in the United States, and I will also add, as a safety regulator, and having operated nuclear reactors and submarines for many years under the Rickover Navy, I believe these nuclear power plants, from my personal perspective, are being operated very safely and professionally. But 2013 was a very challenging year in the United States for the nuclear industry. 
At the beginning of 2013, there were 104 operating reactors. What happened? Well, Crystal River in Florida decided to permanently shut down based on cracks in the containment building. The containment building is this big concrete structure, about four to six feet thick concrete that surrounds the reactor vessel and the pressurized and the steam generators. It cracked during maintenance a few years back and, and Duke Energy decided it's too expensive to move forward with repairs, minimum cost being about $1.5 billion to replace or repair that. Then Dominion Resources had a plant up in Wisconsin called Kiwani. And Kiwani is about a 550 megawatt plant, single unit site, uh, based on the expiration of power purchase agreements. It could not compete with the merchant plant environment in Wisconsin and made the decision to shut down for economic reasons. What is interesting, just down the shores of Lake Michigan from Kiwani, eight miles away is the Point Beach plant, operating two units, making about $15 a megawatt hour profit on power purchase agreements to go out through 2031. The economics were a killer for Kiwani. Then in June of 2013, Southern California Edison made the announcement that they would permanently shut down the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station just outside San Diego. Why? They had major problems with steam generators that had been purchased from Mitsubishi in service less than two years, but had major tube leak issues that could not be clearly resolved going forward. Then the end of this year, Vermont Yankee will shut down, uh, and that will leave us with 99 plants as of the end of 2014. So you know, most would say that sounds like a pretty uh, difficult message. I'd say that most of the issues associated with that are uh, prevalent in the cost of shale gas, the, the lack of a carbon emissions policy uh, that had changed dynamics in the nuclear calculus uh, about seven years ago when people thought there would be a nuclear renaissance. So let's go on and talk about another aspect here. I was asked by Ken to talk about Fukushima Daiichi, the accident that occurred in Japan in March of 2011. I'm going to quickly go through a few slides, cover these at a very high level. How many people here, just as a show of hands, have had a briefing on the Fukushima Daiichi accident? Okay, maybe about a third. I'll quickly go through these. Uh, why is this relevant? The world community is still working at implementing some lessons learned from the operating experience of this horrific accident three and a half years ago. And I'll end up with a slide that talks very briefly about US NRC regulatory actions. So this is the Fukushima Daiichi site, about 150 miles northeast of Tokyo. Six operating reactors, all boiling water reactors of a general electric design. At the time of the event on March 11th of 2011, three of the six reactors were operating, three of them were shut down. And then what happened? A huge earthquake, fifth largest ever recorded. This earthquake, March 11th of 11, basically moved Japan eight feet east on the Earth's axis. That's pretty remarkable, moving it eight feet. Lasts about five minutes. The immediate response of the reactor plants that are operating was appropriate and uh, normal. The plants all shut down. Emergency diesel generators started to provide AC power, and plant conditions were stabilized. So the earthquake did not cause any significant damage to these reactor plants. But 45 minutes later, this tsunami did. The tsunami came in, and I'm going to talk about this 20-foot minute number just for a minute. That station was designed against a 20-foot wall of water coming in from the Pacific Ocean. That was their design basis, so to speak. The actual wall of water from the tsunami that was 45 minutes after the earthquake, the actual wall of water was 46 feet high. And I'll note that most seismic and hydrology experts would calculate that there is about a one in 1,000 probability of this tsunami happening in a given year at this location based on the topography, the seismic fragility of that area of the world. Okay, so this wall of water comes in, you see it on the right hand side, 46 feet. It basically overturns the reactor building 
inundates a site. And so basically you have these AC diesel generators are operating to provide power. Why is that important? You have to have power to run AC driven pumps to circulate cooling water through the core to remove decay heat to prevent the core from melting. It's a decay heat issue, issue even after the reactor's been shut down. Water comes in, 11 out of the 12 diesel generators were flooded. Why? They were located in the basements of these buildings. The 12th generator did not flood. It was located at a much higher site elevation. So we've lost all power from the AC generators that were providing emergency power. The reactor shut down. The DC batteries are operating for a period of time. They provide power through an inverter to provide AC power to run some cooling pumps. But after a period of time, the batteries either are flooded or they're depleted. What happens next? Basically, unit one starts to exhibit fuel melt within about four to seven hours after the tsunami. Then units two and three, it's not clear from forensics yet exactly what point in time, but they melted within 72 hours of the tsunami. And I go back and highlight the bottom bullet here is this 46 foot wall of water was far in excess of the design of 20 foot for that station to withstand. Not only is there the tsunami, but because of the loss of cooling, these fuel elements are heating up very rapidly. These uranium fuel elements are clad with an element called zirconium. Zirconium, in the presence of hot water or steam, generates hydrogen. Hydrogen, as we all know, is very explosive. And so we have a series of three explosions that basically blow the roofs off these reactor buildings. And that's what you see here on the slide. Now, I was on site at, at Fukushima with another commissioner in Jan January of 2012 and saw these fairly up close. Uh, pretty horrific image, a lot of damage. That was what the scene looked like uh, three years ago. Where are we today in Japan? I'll summarize the status. Uh, nobody has died as a result of radiation exposure. The World Health Organization, WHO, has predicted very low health risk from the radiation exposure to the people in this area, even though everybody around that area within a 20 kilometer radius was evacuated. And I drove through the evacuated villages and I was there almost three years ago. Uh, very stark images. We expect it to take at least, or probably around 30 years or so to decommission, to clean up the fuel assemblies and to properly clean up the radioactivity on this site. At the same time, Japan is trying to struggle with its energy future. Japan does not have a wealth of indigenous fuel sources. They've been relying upon imports of coal and natural gas. Within the last month, the NRC equivalent in Japan called the Nuclear Regulation Authority, NRA, has authorized restart of four nuclear power plants in Japan. However, that restart is subject to local prefecture, think county, approval in the United States. Uh, significant damage was done to the credibility and integrity of the government and the utility TEPCO as a result of Fukushima. So there's a significant amount of public mistrust in the country right now. It remains to be seen what will happen, but the government is trying to move forward to restart reactors. So let's shift from Japan to the United States. What have we done in NRC? I'll just comment briefly, after the accident, I was on the commission at that time, we did not shut down U.S. nuclear power plants. Germany took a different path. However, we did believe the United States needed to assess the operating experience and the lessons learned from this accident at Fukushima, and where appropriate, using our regulatory standards, make enhancements. This graphic shows some of the enhancements we've looked at. I'll start out quickly with seismic and flooding, walk downs and reevaluations. I've already mentioned there's this 46 foot of water that came in to Fukushima against a design of 20 feet. 
we've required our licensees to go out and reevaluate their own flooding resilience across the nuclear plants in the United States. We've also required plants to go back and look at what happens in a station blackout and how long can you retain your ability to provide cooling. From 1992 to 1995, I was privileged to serve as a commanding officer of a U.S. nuclear attack submarine, USS Norfolk. I drove that submarine 100,000 miles over three years in command and spent time under the Arctic ice. Now, the submarine I was in command of could not break through the ice if there was a fire or a reactor shutdown. So I made darn sure that our battery was fully charged before we went underneath the ice. So the basic principles of station blackout are very inherent to me as a Rick overtrained submarine officer. We're requiring basically the same kind of analysis by our licensees right now. At Fukushima, there were concerns as to whether or not the spent fuel pool, which had used fuel assemblies in it, whether that pool had been damaged or whether it was dry. It turned out it was not dry. It never did lose its volume. But for a while, there were erratic, erratic indications of spent fuel instrumentation. So we required licensees to enhance their level indication for spent fuel pools. Uh, then we've also required licensees to look at how to handle more than one accident happening at a multi-unit site. So right now, the Vogel site in Georgia uh, will have multiple sites once Vogel's second two plants are built. How can they handle accidents if, if one happens, if, let's say a tornado that goes through that part of Georgia and damages all, all the units? I think we've made a lot of progress in the United States. I think we've taken a very measured approach. I've been heavily focused on decision making in this area as a commissioner. Uh, some may ask, and going back to this news article on my table this morning, have we overregulated? I personally don't think so. I think we've applied appropriate standards. Uh, but I encourage those of you that ask this question, it's a very fair and appropriate question to ask, please go look at our websites and you'll see our written notation votes that have detailed explanations for our decision on various Fukushima issues. I'll note that recently we had to decide on whether or not to require expedited transfer of spent fuel out of spent fuel pools into dry cash storage, and the commission by a vote of four to one said, no, we're not going to require that. So we turned that regulatory um, option down. Okay, let's go uh, away from Fukushima. Let's look at new reactor construction. As Bill Sandifer mentioned, there are five reactors being built in the United States right now. All five of these are in your member states, two in Georgia, two in South Carolina, and one in Tennessee. Uh, I'll comment very briefly on these. I'll mention the AP-1000 units under construction. These are Westinghouse designs in Georgia, just south of Augusta, and in South Carolina, just north of Columbia. And in contrast to the Fukushima reactors, these reactors for Westinghouse design have significant safety enhancements using passive flow based on gravity or natural circulation, does not require AC-driven pumps to circulate water to remove decay heat. That's a significant design feature enhancement over the Fukushima design reactors. I'm not going to go into any more detail here. Uh, going back to Julio's presentation and talking about China and where they are, uh, could not agree more, more fully with Julio on that. China is building 31 units today. There's 67 reactors under construction in some form or fashion around the world outside the United States today. So even in light of the Fukushima experience, rural community in many places moving forward with nuclear, China, Russia, South Korea. I hosted the uh, vice chairman of the Indian Authority in the NRC two weeks ago for lunch. He had a delegation, and India is building or plans to build 10 thorium based reactors in the near future. So the world community has taken steps with, based on Fukushima, still moving forward in many sectors with construction. Okay, a little show and tell here. Uh, got some South Carolina folks. This is a picture of the summer. Construction, I mentioned the containment, which basically provides a barrier against the atmosphere from any releases from the reactor vessel. This is a picture shown in June of this year, and I was down at the site. Another aerial view of summer. Fascinating site, both at summer and Vogel. There's between 2,500 and 3,000 workers as we speak working in those four units under construction. The shot of Vogel. Some of you may have heard about modular construction. The Shaw Group then 
bought out by Chicago Bridge and Iron. There's a major effort underway to build modules, ship them to the site, and use those to establish the basic containment structure. This is part of what's called the auxiliary building, the CA-20 module. Huge structure. Uh, this was placed at Vogel in March of this year. I had a chance to visit back in June to look at how they're attaching that to the base mat foundation. Going back to China, China's also building an AP-1000 Westinghouse design. I bring this up because they're about two or three years ahead of us in schedule. There's a very fruitful, healthy dialogue between the Chinese regulator in Beijing and the NRC to discuss and exchange views on construction oversight issues between the Chinese and U.S. regulators. We've had people on site off and on for the last three plus years. There's also a fifth site under construction. I know Bill Johnson's going to talk about that here in a few minutes, so I won't steal any of his thunder, but it, this is a, a good news story. Watch Bar 2 construction had started, stopped, resumed again in 2008. I had a chance to be there in January of this year. And this is actually the first of these five units that we expect to be going online here, perhaps by late 2015 or so. Uh, a lot of progress has been made by TVA in this arena. And I know that Bill will address this in more detail. People hear about small modular reactors, what's happening in this arena. When I got to the commission in April 2010, SMRs were a hot topic. Uh, slowed down a bit as the nuclear renaissance dynamic changed in this country. But there are still SMR projects going on. There's four potential vendors, two of whom, B&W and New Scale, have received funding awards from the Department of Energy. Uh, these designs are refer, SMRs refer to less than 300 megawatt electric production. Uh, this shows the four. They vary in size from 50 megawatts to around 225 megawatts. The concept would be to have factory fabricated manufactured components shipped to site, final assembly on site, and perhaps having clusters of four to six or more reactors. We expect to receive the first license application from New Scale, perhaps sometime in 2016. I'm going to shift to my last topic, and that is two slides to deal with spent nuclear fuel, a very frequent topic. Sometimes it has political or emotional overtones. I'm going to summarize very quickly. There's two issues here. One is to what extent is spent nuclear fuel currently stored on site at existing nuclear power plants being stored safely and securely? And I'll note that it's the Department of Energy's responsibility, not the Department, not the NRC's responsibility to develop a high-level waste repository. I think most of you know that. I'm not going to go into the details here, but basically in 2012, the NRC lost a court decision in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals that struck down a 1984 waste confidence decision saying you have not fully analyzed for what happens for spent fuel pool leaks, spent fuel pool fires, or what happens if the administration never proceeds to build a high-level waste repository, a.k.a. Yucca Mountain? The Yucca Mountain piece is out of our hands. We license it, but we do not develop it. As a commissioner, we joined together and uh, directed our staff to revise this rule to address the D.C. Circuit's court opinion. This commission order came out in September 2012, told them to go back and do further research analysis in these, these areas. They did that this summer. In August 2013, the commission approved this rule that was published in the Federal Register just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we received 33,000 public comments from around the country on this rule. I got notice just yesterday after I got to the airport here in the afternoon that we've been challenged in court by uh, some, some environmental groups. Remains to be seen what will happen in this area. Last topic on waste deals with Yucca Mountain, high-level waste disposal. Um, just in full disclosure, I voted against the Department of Energy to not allow them to withdraw their license application. From, when they submitted a motion back in 2010 to the NRC. A lot of controversy here, which I won't go into. Many of you are familiar with this. But basically, Yucca Mountain is still, as of today, is the repository required by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. The NRC has gone through uh, the court system 
And we basically have directed our staff to finish the safety evaluation reports, which we expect to be finished in January of 2015, just another three plus months from now. I can't tell you what that's gonna, those reports will say, but we believe that uh, that will help inform any future decision by the Department of Energy or the administration on where and how to look at developing a repository. Last slide, I'm not gonna read it to you. I wanna kind of maybe dovetail a little bit on Julio's comments here. Uh, I agree completely with my colleague that we need all of the above for energy and that nuclear is part of that. I'll say that from the experience learned in construction of Summer and Vogel, that if you have a long hiatus from nuclear construction, it can be difficult to resume that construction as far as your skill sets, the human capital, manufacturing, et cetera. I'll also comment that one of the policy issues associated with nuclear and other sources, coal, gas, oil, is to what extent does our energy policy a pr place a premium on 24-7 baseload generation? Right now, that's not being valued in the marketplace to the, any extent to recognize what the baseload capability can provide. Last thing is that nuclear today provides between 61 and 64 percent of the carbon-free emission in the United States for electrical generation capacity. And if the country is going to embrace a carbon emissions policy, I'm not going to get into that debate one way or the other, but if they do, nuclear is perhaps a part of that solution. I thank you for your attention. I'll defer to Ken and company whether you have time for questions, but I appreciate the invitation to be here and appreciate what you guys do on the SSEB. Thank you. Do we have questions for the commissioner? I, have, <clears throat> I enjoyed your presentation. Thanks, Randy. Um, I, I have a concern about just last week we saw where other countries are held to a different standard on the, you know, on the environmental things. And China was exempted from some of those things. Do you have concerns that China was exempted from some of the same standards that we're going to be held accountable for on the environmental global change? You talk about in the nuclear area? <clears throat> no, uh, all their, you know, like I know that they're talking about in regulatory and in the climate change that they're, it might, may have been dealing with just coal, but that, I had some concerns about China not being held as responsible on their environmental things. Well, I'm not, I can't tell you I'm, I'm well informed or very knowledgeable in the non-nuclear aspects of this question, because I think primarily that's what you're getting at. I note that Julio talked about one, two, one, two across the board for the U.S.-China lash up in different, different categories. Uh, I know I've been to Beijing uh, not as many times as uh, Julio's been, but I know that my eyes burned very uh, strongly uh, from the air quality being very poor. And to the extent that China is, you know, the predominant player in this area for uh, emissions going forward, I think the concern, that concern is valid. On the nuclear side, I'll comment that uh, we have a very strong relationship with NNSA, the Chinese Nuclear Regu Regulatory Authority. From time to time, they will ask us questions. We don't regulate what they do, but we do have exchanges on an in informal level to uh, share nuclear safety standards between how we would do business in the United States and what they might think about as far as asking questions for their various projects at Sandman and elsewhere. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner, I've got a couple of them I'd like to ask you about, if I may. Uh, we, we see the enormous price of a nuclear facility today, and we see some companies pulling out of that even though they've gotten a, a first step. What can we do uh, at our level to help those companies understand the longevity of the nuclear versus the uh, certain price uh, in a given period of time? I worked as a staff member of the House Armed Services Committee for about three and a half years uh, after I left the Navy. And this is not a criticism, it's just a reality, is that most of the views in the legislative branch are fairly short term. And getting people to think about energy needs at the 100 year, 500 year standpoint is almost impossible in this country. 
when I go visit international colleagues elsewhere, uh, other countries do have longer term strategic approaches for their energy supplies. Uh, we heard from Mike uh, in the first presentation this morning about the rapidly depleting oil and gas wells in cer certain sectors while others are being brought online. And so I think that trying to look at a long term view rather than the next two to five years or ten years is probably the biggest thing that I've seen in my discussions with people in the United States as well as overseas. Okay. And, and one final one, will you talk with us just a little bit about the MOX conversion? Sure. And I think that, that that ties right in with the, uh, the repository at Yucca Mountain. So if you would elaborate yeah. on that a little, I'd appreciate it. Well, the MOX is, is the NRC has responsibility to license MOX, but the MOX project itself is a Department of Energy project. Um, I was a principal deputy or number two person at the National Nuclear Security Administration in August of 2007 when ground was broken on MOX. So I was a big proponent of MOX. Uh, I was chief operating officer for NSA for a couple of years before coming to the NRC. Uh, I don't want to make this a NRC versus DOE kind of response, but to this date, I've not seen any other viable alternative to disposition weapons-grade plutonium. And I, I don't agree personally or from some position of knowledge with the administration's decision to not move forward with MOX. It's not my decision. We're there just to license it. It's DOE's call. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner.